I know that's a strange title, but uh, we're continuing our series on the Beatitudes, and I always try to pick titles that are going to make you think about the application of blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The problem is that many of us have an appetite and a hunger and thirst for other things than righteousness. Uh, and they could be an addiction. Now, I, I know some of you may say, I'm not an addict. Well, just think about your addiction to your mobile phone or addiction to your iPad, addiction to games. Anything that you overindulge your appetite in actually becomes an addiction in many ways. And we, we do have lots of different addictions which we wouldn't call addictions but there are, there are things that perhaps take up more of our time than they should when Jesus should be the centre. We've been singing Jesus be the centre of my life yet so often there are other things that do take up a lot of time. We are um, looking at the fourth beatitude today and it's the, the centre step it's the middle of the Beatitudes. The first three, uh, you could almost call roots for the tree. The, the roots of uh, the, recognizing our, our poorness in spirit, our, our need to mourn, our sins and meekness that we looked at last week. Today, we are looking at the trunk of the tree. The righteousness that God has given us through Jesus Christ, but also the righteousness that we need to draw on from him hunger and thirst for which will eventually produce the fruits of purity and um, whatever the other two were that I forgot now uh, see I'm not there yet I'm still on the bottom rung of the ladder still thinking about being poor in spirit but, so we're, we're moving from the roots today into the trunk the characteristic of Jesus Christ that we need to draw on all the time to produce the fruit and as we've said all the way through our study of the Beatitudes you don't get to this fourth step until you've gone through the first three and I'll put the picture of the ladder back up in fact the backbone of the Christian life if you like the strength of our life is the fact that Jesus didn't die just for your sin he didn't die to get you into heaven he died to make you righteous that's what the Bible tells us. But how many of you, when you hear that word, think, I'm not righteous? Well, you, you know from Scripture that you are, in Jesus Christ, righteous. But when you think about your actions, day by day, you think, I've got a long way to go. Well, I hope you think you've got a long way to go. Otherwise, I'm really in a sad state because I've got a long way to go. <laughs> you know, but we need to hunger and draw on that righteousness so that it changes us. Um, I, it's always a, an awkward thing when you're preparing a message and then in the morning before you give the message you get another verse and you think, where does it fit in? So I hope it fits in the right place. This isn't the one, it's the next one. But you see, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. So it's not about thirsting and righteousness. It gets really complicated, doesn't it? but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Do you want to be pleasing to God? Yes. Draw on that righteousness. Have the peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit because the other things that we consume in life not just food and drink but things that we consume our time with uh, Kingdom of God is not about that. It's about righteousness. That's what it's about. And the next verse is the one that really stuck with me this morning. For if by one man's offence death reigned through the one, i.e. Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 17. There's a lot of depth in that. You, it wouldn't do any of us any harm to meditate on that one verse alone this morning. 
but I'm, I'm going to leave that for you to do afterwards. We have received, because of the work of Jesus Christ, righteousness, so that we can reign in life. Who remembers that verse in Deuteronomy? It says that we are not the tail, we're the head. We're above, not under. It actually says it the other way around, but I just want to... Only can we be in control, or only can he be in control in our life, if we have righteousness in us. In all situations where we think that other things are controlling us, that's when we need to say, am I in that righteous place with God? Because the righteousness of God in me enables me to be above all circumstances, above all things. We have the ability to have control over our sin when we accept that we are made righteous in Jesus Christ. It should give us a desire. This is what Jesus is saying. Because he's put that righteousness in us, it should make us thirst and hunger for more. But we thirst and hunger for more blessings. We thirst and hunger for more intimacy with God. We thirst and hunger for so many other things, but how many of us actually truly think, I want to be more righteous than I am? It's a challenge, isn't it? Because it's not the first thing that comes to our mind when we're thinking about, what am I pursuing? But the Beatitudes call us to pursue after the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And that includes righteousness. You see, through the work of Jesus Christ, we have a foretaste of righteousness. For me, it would be like eating one crisp out of cheese and onion crisps out of a Walker's packet. I would have to eat the whole packet. One would never satisfy me. It's a bad example, but when we foretaste the things of Jesus, we should want more and more and more. But I sometimes think that we think we get, we get it in our heads that righteousness, and this is true, in our own strength is not possible. But because we don't see a lot of it around us, and we always find ourselves failing, it's not the thing that we go after. We've given up hope of being righteous in all areas of our life. When that righteousness has already been planted in us, and we need to draw on it. Just imagine what it will be like in heaven where there will be no unrighteousness at all. Can you imagine what it would be like if right now in this world there was no unrighteousness? If there was no selfish desires? If everyone lived according to God's standards? If there was nothing, no deceit, no lies, no coveting, no theft, no murder? No bitterness, no strife, no malice, no abuse. Won't it be wonderful? That's where we're going. But God says, we as believers in Jesus Christ, and because of the work he's done in us, can be showing the world what this righteousness is like. That's our mission. Not just to save them from their sins, although that will happen if they become righteous as a result of looking at us. Not just to get them a ticket to heaven, but for them to be righteous too. We are the salt and the light of the earth, aren't we? Yes. Well, we should be. And our righteousness should shine forth. You see, it's great that Birgit put that picture up this morning. Sometimes there is darkness in us. Sometimes there is darkness around us. But we have a light inside of us that by his spirit will shine bright and overcome the darkness. The darkness of this world will only be overcome by Jesus' light shining through you and me and all of us here. Isaiah chapter 32 verses 16 to 18 just thrill me. Justice will dwell in the desert. See, justice and righteousness can dwell in a barren land such as Great Britain or the Sahara or anywhere else. Justice will dwell in the desert and righteousness 
live in the fertile field and the fruit of righteousness will be peace who would like a bit more peace the effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever my people will live in peaceful dwelling places even in St. Earth in secure homes in undisturbed places of rest these are the things that flow out of righteousness peace confidence quietness being undisturbed most of us could do a bit more of that couldn't we well I can anyway what an awesome thing it, it is then that we are, have been made righteous by Jesus Christ but he is on a mission in our lives to make us more righteousness and he needs us to cooperate with him yeah that is the next verse 2 Corinthians chapter 5 21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that's mind boggling in itself the most righteous being in the whole universe came into a body was made sin so that we didn't have to be sinful so that we could be righteous so that in him we might become the righteousness of God that is just wow yeah. you are made righteous through Jesus Christ and today's verse is the one I quoted earlier blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness who want more of it that have tasted and seen that the Lord is good that righteousness is good and that we want to be more righteous yet we can get so distracted by other things in this world that our focus is on things and circumstances and not on the righteousness of God many of them can be legitimate pleasures you know God created an awful lot of things in this world that we are meant to enjoy but we can overindulge our appetite in those things there's nothing wrong with a mobile phone it's a useful tool but if we're falling down manholes because we're texting as we're walking along and not seeing there's something wrong with us isn't there if we can't talk to one another because we're so used to texting we've broken down the gift of communication and it may not just be mobile phones and computers which are the obvious things to think of see they're overindulged appetites to me that's an addiction and I'm as guilty as anybody else at times and sometimes we need to fast from those things as much as we need to fast from food so that we get our focus back onto God and you may say well people can't change their appetites well they can I mean it's surprising isn't it that people used to be addicted to nicotine now they're addicted to e-cigarettes they can change their appetites alright it's changed from one bad thing to another bad thing in my mind Linda's had to change her eating habits for health reasons she thought she was going to be eating horrible food didn't you? didn't want to change but she's changed and now she enjoys the food she's eating and she's healthier as a consequence that's about food but it's the same with our relationship with God we can give up things that are distracting us from God and eat and enjoy something better called righteousness what is Jesus actually asking us to do in this beatitude as I say the trunk of the tree is righteousness the backbone of a Christian is righteousness and the trunk of a tree should suck the life out of the roots and feed the fruit that's why it's important that we pursue righteousness because it will produce all the fruit of the spirit within us and there are three key things within uh, this verse in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 we are on verse 6 aren't we oh yeah he clothed us in righteousness how did that end up there um, the first one is relentless pursuit 
That's what Jesus is calling us to. Relentless pursuit. Okay. It's not just a vague interest in being righteous. It's not just occasionally thinking, yes, I'm meant to be righteous, but I've got other things to think about. It's actually hunger and thirst means that you're going to go and feed yourself on something, doesn't it? Or drink something. You don't just say, oh yeah, I'm thirsty, I'll just sit here and die of thirst. It should create a pursuit in you to go after something. So, that's what Jesus is calling us to. A driving passion for something different. And that passion for righteousness should be the hallmark of every believer. It shows you are a genuine believer if that's what you're after. Of course, your passion for being a believer may be, I just want to get into heaven. Or it may be, I just want all the blessings that Jesus has to offer me. It may be that I'm just grateful for the fact that my sins are forgiven. But it's more than that. We should have a relentless pursuit after the righteousness that God has planted in us and made available to us. David said in the Psalms, didn't he, my soul thirsts for you. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, towards the end of his life, said something really strange. The man who planted more churches than anybody else, the man who suffered more than anybody else, says that his life same, right at the end of his life, while he's in prison, I want to know more of Jesus Christ. Do you want to know more of him? I trust so. When Holy Spirit is in a person's life, they are hungry for more. If the Holy Spirit has been ignored, then you're unlikely to be hungry for more of him. Hunger, as I've said, because I've preached recently on hunger and thirst, and I don't want to stick too long on, on that side of it, is a sign of need. If you're hungry, you need food. If you're hungry for righteousness, you need more righteousness. The people who are blessed are those who know their need for righteousness. And I'll leave you with a question right now. Do you know how much righteousness you need? Do you know you haven't got enough yet? You probably do, but I hope you haven't given up wanting more because you've not attained it. Because if you know you need more, that's a great sign. It's like being hungry. It's a sign of spiritual life when we need righteousness. And, you know, the flesh hungers for sin and self-satisfaction. But the spirit of a believer hungers for righteousness. And it's a sign that you're healthy and that you have a good appetite and that you're going to spiritually live. It requires us to have a holy passion. Our passion is to be like Jesus, righteous in every way. We, have, we are searching for the great satisfaction that righteousness brings to the believer. The ones that we mentioned from Isaiah. Peace, joy, quietness, confidence. You know, one of the things that stops you being the head is when that you know that you're a sinner and you feel guilty about it and you feel condemned about it. What you need to know is that you are righteous in Christ and to repent from the sin. Be cleansed. Know and be confident that you are righteous in Jesus Christ. Then you'll be the head again. The only thing that will be completely satisfied in Scripture is your hunger for righteousness. That's an incredible thought, isn't it? You will be completely satisfied in that according to what Jesus says in this beatitude. So, are we pursuing it? Just, if I ask you the question, what did Jesus die for? I've already mentioned this several times, so you probably know the answer already. Was it forgiveness? Was it a ticket to heaven? Or was it righteousness? Just a few verses, it's in your notes to think about in cell groups. 
2 Corinthians 5 15 says Christ died for all that those who live may live for him in righteousness 1 Peter 2 24 he himself bore our sins on the tree why that we might die to sin and live for righteousness 2 Corinthians 5 25 one we've already looked at he became sin why so that we might become righteous that was his passion that's what he died for everything he suffered was that we may be righteous hallelujah if he's done all that it's possible it's possible okay what a swap yet there's a strange paradox Colin loves paradoxes he's always telling me there's loads of paradoxes in the Bible whenever we talk about it it says here hunger and thirst and you will be satisfied well if you're satisfied you won't be hungry and thirsty will you but it's one of those things there's always more it's, it, it, it's, it's like eating the Walker's cheese and onion crisp for me I always want more because it's so good it's so good I, I was satisfied with the one but I want more I want more you may have different passions in, in food that give you that more whether it be a word as original or, or whatever bad illustration in many ways because you can over feed yourself on Walker's crisp um, but the more we taste of God the more you want because it's bigger than we could ever cope with but we will always be satisfied with whatever we taste of and we will always want more it's one of those strange paradoxes that Colin loves to tell me about A.W. Tozer in his book The Pursuit of God says to have found God and still pursue him to, find, to have found God and still go after him is the soul's paradox of love we have found Jesus when we became a Christian but we're still pursuing him because we would love and want to know more about him so how do we develop our hunger and thirst well we know we need to develop an attitude for righteousness which means changing our diet our spiritual diet Jesus says blessed are they who hunger after righteousness notice that the blessing is because we're hungry not because we're already righteous but because we're hungry for more he intends to bless our hunger not what we already have because if he was blessing our righteousness we'd all be doomed <laughs> wouldn't we yeah. it's not even the realisation of the desire but the fact that we have a desire for more righteousness being righteous will mean something different to different people and the challenges of being righteous are different for each of us depending on what level, line of work we're in what married relationships we're in I'm treading on dangerous ground there um, our, our home situation how money is supplied to us because in the work situation what's, what's the moral re requirement on us is to work hard but we work hard for good reward and if we don't think our employer is rewarding us enough we're slacking off is that righteous? no God calls us to work as if working unto the Lord what about um, if we're dependent upon benefits because of sickness or, or whatever do we do we ever have a moral conflict there about what we claim you know if I've got savings do I hide them so that the benefit department don't know that I've got them so that we can get the maximum it's like tax isn't it we know the tax man's got plenty of money 
So it doesn't need to know how much I've got. There's a moral conflict going on when we're filling out our tax forms, when we're claiming our benefits, our pension, when, um, even when we're shopping. We might be tempted not to tell our partner what we bought. Not that I ever do that. Yes, I do. <laughs> but there are more things that face each one of us in different situations. You know, even at work, taking the odd pen home, we think it's our right because our employer hasn't paid on us to have a pen. So we take the pens home. You know, the moral choices that we face every day are different for every one of us. But if we want to show the salt and light of being a Christian, we need to be righteous in all our doings and make the right moral choices. So what is the consequence of not being righteous? I always like to look at the negative side, of it, first of all. It means that the world is deprived of seeing the character of God. It's possible in mankind and the world falls apart doesn't it when, we, when anyone is unrighteous other people are hurt because self comes into play so what does the world do it creates rules and regulations to try and make sure that things are done in the correct way and it don't work because we're crafty and we find loopholes to get round the laws and the regulations. Look at all those, even, dare I say, Donald Trump and his declaration that he had a 600 million, no, 600 million loss so he could avoid paying tax. It was a legitimate way of avoiding tax. But was it righteous? I don't know. That's on his conscience, not mine. But how many people avoid taxation legitimately when they know that really they should have paid tax. Why do I get on to that? So they make all these rules and regulations. I, I'm going to be dangerous again. Just look at the EU. What is a cabbage? 26,111 words to describe what a cabbage is to make sure shops sell genuine cabbages. But people find their ways around it, won't they? The problem is that we create rules and regulations to make things, to, to try and stop people getting around the system, but they always find another way. You know, if you want to go into Burger King, What's a burger look like? Well, they've got a picture on the wall and there's probably a thousand words written down somewhere exactly what's in that burger to make sure that they get their full profit and you get what, what they want you to get. That's a consequence of unrighteousness in the world. Rules and regulations that are still being broken. Here is a problem as stated by Jesus. Men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Therefore, we should not be surprised or caught unaware that sinners sin. It should be no surprise to us. They will be unrighteous. But that doesn't give you an excuse because you have Jesus in you and you are righteous. So your moral choices need to be based on on what the characteristics of Jesus and of God he got away with only making ten commandments and we still broke them but people would say these days that morality is personal what's right for you is not right for me our morality is based on God's standards and it's about serving him 
I don't know where I've gone on my notes, but never mind. Creating the right appetite. Here's an interesting one. People naturally change churches through their life. Linda and I have been in goodness knows how many. Anglican, Baptist, Nonconformist, Pentecostal, and all the others. But you'll notice that every church has a slightly different appetite. It might be an appetite for worship. We think of hill songs. It's a big thing, isn't it? Worship is their main one. It might be an appetite for the prophetic. It might be an appetite for the Word of God. I trust that we have an appetite for the Word of God. Uh, it could be... Uh, an appetite for donuts in the middle of the service. <laughs> but it isn't some churches. It's all about the fellowship time in the middle of the service. They're all fine, but they're an overindulgence in one thing rather than concentrating on the whole spectrum of what God has for us. And the problem is that when you've been in one type of church that you really like, you spend your life looking for the same type of church when God perhaps wants you to change your appetite you might find it boring coming to a church like us and just hearing the word of God but God wants you to know the word and sometimes we have to sit under the word for a long period of time whether it be in a brethren church, a Baptist church or wherever that's what God wants for you at a particular time they might think you're terrible in your worship life. They might take you to hill songs for a period of time. But we, we do need to change our appetite. Regular diet cultivates appetite over time. Linda didn't like the food that she had to eat initially. But after a period of time, your taste buds change. And you like it because you're better. I like the word of God because it does me a lot of good. Yeah? I like worship because it does me a lot of good. But you have to feed on it regularly. There's no good saying, oh, I've got to eat. What, what was the first thing you went, went to? I've got to eat a load of nuts. Not you lot peanuts and things like that I've got to eat a load of nuts and I don't like nuts well after a while you will begin to like them the trouble is that we don't take a step of changing our appetite towards the things that we naturally like food wise but we also need to change our appetite spiritually if we're spending too much time uh, I'm trying to think of something that I haven't already dealt with oh please ignore the spelling mistakes and the grammatical errors in my notes this week I don't know what's happened I've got oh no, I won't say what it is you'll find it um, trying to think of, say you're passionate oh no John's here sorry John say you're passionate about Formula 1 sorry I'm not talking about you John honest you're... I'm not I'm not I'm not, I'm not. Because, because John's got it in control I know he's got it in control but you could be so engrossed in Formula 1 that you might decide I'm not reading my Bible today I'm oh one art are playing somewhere I'm not, I'm not going to one art because so and so is having a race that could become a distraction couldn't it John isn't like that he's very good but all sorts of things can consume our attention and take it away from God and we need to be certain that we can change our appetite like last week how many of you stuck up 10, 10 strategies for being meek on your fridge only two of you how terrible you are I was hoping I would have a thinner congregation this week because you were all avoiding the fridge because it told you how to be meek 
we know we um, didn't have a fridge. You didn't have a fridge. <laughs> Well, this week I've got five. Five strategies for developing a godly appetite. Right. The first step is the easy one. Remember to be poor in spirit, to be meek, and to mourn your sins. Remember that you've got to go through a progression. Draw from the roots. If you realise how poor you are, you'll want more of God's righteousness. Number two, the one that we all hate. Practice fasting of legitimate pleasures. Mark 8, 34 says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So whatever your legitimate pleasure is, or maybe even your illegitimate pleasure, fast from it for a period of time. Focus on the word of God. Spend more time in prayer. Spend more time in worship. Whatever it is, indulge a passion for the things of God and your appetite will change see grazing between meals ruins your appetite doesn't it your natural appetite but I wonder how much grazing goes on between one Sunday and another Sunday or one cell group and another cell group or one morning devotional and the next morning's devotional. How much grazing goes on outside of the things that really uh, you should be concentrated on for the sake of righteousness. You work up an appetite by exercise. I hate that word. (laughs) But it's good to exercise. You know, it's okay reading the scriptures, but try applying them as well. You know, you learned about meekness last week. How many of you have found that you're stronger this week? Uh, not enough application going on. <laughs> but there will have been some improvement. I'm sure there will have, because you've thought about it. you thought about it. I, I think I'm a bit... I'll not comment. (laughs) Well done. You see, I I know there have been times when I've had to give up the TV and not watch it so much. There are times when I've had to put my laptop down and talk to Linda. Really annoying. (laughs) No, it's not. It's really good. But there, there are times when we have to fast the things that are okay for us to do and okay for us to relax and, and play golf or whatever it is but when that takes over time from God the only way we're ever going to get back is a time of fasting and changing our appetite to something else fasting is a means of cleansing the body in terms of food fasting from things that distract you spiritually is a means of cleansing your soul so that you want more of God one preacher said why do we wait for Lent before we give up things fasting is something that we should be practicing in different areas of our life all the time to make sure that our hunger is for righteousness question you don't need to put your hands up or tell me what it is when did you last fast a legitimate pleasure when did you decide that's got more of a hold on me than it should and I need to stop doing that for a period of time doesn't mean that you don't pick it up again it just means that you have more control over it make your son self vulnerable to the needs of others 1 Timothy 4 7 says train yourself in, in godliness exercise in the gift of of mercy is like running because you extend yourself in serving other people you reach out to the needs of those who have got less now I know many of you already reach out in acts of mercy in acts of uh, being kind to other people whether you're street pastors whether you're serving on food bank whether you're serving the homeless 
uh, in Penzance, or whether you're just reaching out to your neighbour and making sure they have a friend, and perhaps inviting them for a meal. Those things will help you in your walk with God, and they are righteous acts that you will do. We don't have to wait for Lent. We don't have to wait for, what is it, random acts of kindness, promotions and things like that. We should always be being righteous towards those who are vulnerable. As a nation, we should be being righteous to the, the people who are in the jungle at Calais who are not going to have anywhere to live and there's a thousand children there and nobody wants them. Nobody's making provision for them. That's what the church is here for, to show God's righteousness and love to such situations. Next one. Use your troubles and blessings as an incentive to feed on Christ. John chapter 6, verse 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Whoever feeds on him, this bread, will live forever. You're going to live forever, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll start feeding more. Somebody like, likened the troubles and the blessings in life to being like HP sauce and horseradish sauce. Some of them are bitter and some of them make the food taste nice. But we need, sometimes in our diet, things to make things taste even better. And the troubles and blessings that we have in our life are the spice to life. The nice taste, the sugar and the honey. Somebody actually said that persecution is like eating chilli. <laughs> I don't know whether chilli makes food taste nice or not. Who, uh, it does. We had those chilli and beetroot. Who made those the other week? The chilli and beetroot chocolate brownies. We still don't know who made them. They were nice until the last bite. Are you volunteering as the person who made them? No. <laughs> I saw a great picture on Facebook the other day. A friend of ours who's into incredible puns. There's a bowl of chilli sat out in the garden. And they said, it's chilli outside. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, when the worst comes, remember that God is at your right hand. Amen. Amen. That's the source. That's the flavour that helps you go through the difficult times in life. And the last one, it may seem a strange one, is to trust in Christ, especially in relation to your sanctification. You know, we, we trust Jesus for many things. But you can trust Jesus that he intends to make you more righteous. He only wants your cooperation in the process. But he can do it. Don't give up. Don't think you will never become like Jesus Christ. Because one day in the twinkling of an eye, you will be. But you can enjoy it now. He's already clothed you with righteousness. He died to make you righteous. If he was that convinced that you were going to be righteous, then you can be. He has no doubt about it. It's only us that doubts the fact that we can be righteous. Isn't that good news? Yes. You're just like Jesus Christ in the making. Yeah. Work in progress. There's more work to be done in me yeah. and there's a lot more work to be done in you. <laughs> <laughs> From glory to glory. Amen. So... Those are your five strategies for. 1 Timothy 4 7 is not. It's not that one. Is it? Yeah, well, whoever's got a concordance, look up. Train yourself in godliness. I think it was 1 Timothy. Maybe it's 2 Timothy 4 7. I sometimes put the wrong numbers down. Yeah. Anyway.
you, you can find it. You know the verse I meant, don't you? Where Paul encourages you to train yourself for godliness. Let's pray. Our oh, Father God, I just thank you so much that you are so confident that we can become more like you day by day. That you died and are committed to the process of making us righteous. Father, I ask that you would increase our hunger and thirst for righteousness. Lord, we know that we cannot make ourselves more righteous. It's only by the work of Jesus Christ. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to work on us, Lord, to challenge us when we uh, are perhaps thinking wrong, when our time is consumed by the wrong things. Lord, that you would work with us in that process of changing our appetite to be more like Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your incredible forgiveness that you pour upon each one of us, your incredible patience as we uh, stumble our way through life looking for more of you. And Lord, I pray that this week we will see greater righteousness in each one of us, that the world will see that, that they will have a revelation of the righteousness of the mercy and the love of God for each one of your saints here in this place. For your glory, Jesus. We are sat in Jesus' name. Amen.